Are you ready for the Low Blows Network? Hi guys, Rick here. Before we get to this episode of Paddy's New Yacht, I'd like to talk briefly about gambling because it'll be discussed a lot on this show. Gambling is supposed to be fun and accoutrement to your sporting weekend. However, it can also be debilitating and ruin lives. If you find that your gambling gets in the way of work, school or other activities, causes mental or physical health issues, causes any issues in your life, gives you financial stress of any kind or damages your reputation, then gambling may be a danger to you. If you spot any of these signs in yourself, stop gambling immediately, consult problemgambling.ie for all resources that can assist you, and help yourself before it's too late. And now, on to Paddy's new yacht. Former pro wrestler Rick Nash and former Paddy Power insider David Ken are not good gamblers. They're sports fanatics who are determined to crack the code and make it rich on sports gambling or die trying. This time next year, we'll be millionaires. Follow them on their journey to eventual bankruptcy every Friday on the Lobos Network with sports tips that made so much sense at the time in Paddy's New Yacht. Declan Rice. Our old pal had a big day this week and a kind of awkward day. But look, I'd say his confidence was sky high as he was named the FAI Young Player of the Year. On the same day, he was given his first call up for the England international squad. It's tough not to take that personally at some stage, like as just a fuck you to Ireland. So we kind of put ourselves in it as well by giving him the award to begin with. Uh, But as we get kicked off here... On another edition of Paddy's New Yacht, Rick Nash and the Daily Star and Buzz.ie's David Kent in for another week. A big week this week. What was the most awkward award in sports history for you, Dave? It's one that kind of happens every other year. It's like we all, we all see when we watch golf these wonderful trophies that you're giving. Obviously, you get like the green jacket at Augusta as well, the claret jug at the Open. And then you look at what the Italian Open do, the Italian sponsors do. And like when you think of Italy, you think of magnificent motor industry, fashion, food. The winner of the Italian Open, yes, he does get a trophy, but he also gets his weight in cheese. <laughs> and every year, the winner makes the same face because they forget about that. And it's just like, oh, here's two enormous blocks of gorgonzola. Better look happy with these. <laughs> and it's just like, it's a tradition. I get it's a tradition, Italy, but come on. Like... <laughs> Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna play all like imagine you just really want they were lactose intolerant or something. And he just wanted the trophy. Like, you can't just, just drop the cheese. It's, it's bizarre, <laughs> but it's entertaining. <laughs> yeah, because you're then left with the conundrum of I either have to eat this now or I'm gonna have to pay more <laughs> for my baggage in the airport on the way home. Like you're just giving someone a fucking burden there at that stage. Uh, for me, I'm gonna go for uh Louis Figo, who won the Ballon d'Or in the year two thousand. Um, he won it in one of the most controversial uh, circumstances possible and awkward as well because you may remember if you were a fan around that time that Luis Figo um, made a quite ballsy move moving from Real Madrid to uh, from Barcelona to Real Madrid as part of the Galacticos era. I think he was the first Galactico. Um, yeah, he was the major. Yeah, and, and, and then won the Ballon d'Or off the back of his contributions for Barca while there were like protests and he was hated. I think Real had a game of Barca around that period as well that was very, very awkward. Like again, this is when like relations were, this is when relations were at their lowest. You're talking like near, you know, old firm levels of animosity here. <laughs> so for the star player of Barca to move Move to their arch rivals. It's like Mo Salah signing for Man United, essentially, or Man City. It's like, what have you done? Like, you have just fucked us over and helped our arch rivals. And then he won the Ballon d'Or and had to stand there while a video package of his contributions for his old club. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's like being at a dinner, like, and then, like, uh, it's like being at a dinner or something, like, celebrating you and then having pictures of yeah. you with your ex on the screen while your new girlfriend just sits there politely trying to smile and look like she isn't hating every second of it. Uh, so, yeah, that's about as awkward. So, Declan Rice, you know, at least he didn't have to get up in front of people. At least he didn't have to give a speech. At least he didn't have to, you know, there was none of that involved. The FAI Youth Player of the Year, I'm not sure the ceremonial uh, duties of it all. I think it's just some Something that they say, and they might send him out a plaque somewhere. No. So he no, has to get up. In the woods. He has to get no, up. No, and... he's not. He's not. He's not coming. It's on Sunday night, and the FAI made the point in the statement at the end when they confirmed this to the media that Declan Rice will not be at the Three Arena or wherever it is to collect his international oh. award. So it's going to be sent in the mail, I'd imagine. But oh. like, I don't. For once, I actually don't blame the FAI on this. It's not their fault. Right. It was the jury who two weeks ago reconvened after he had switched and gone, yeah, look, we'll still give it to him. Like, come on, it was going to be an own goal either way. <laughs> what I is mean, that like? Yeah, what is that? Is that he, like, you know, trying to make your ex feel bad or something like that by posting, like, fucking pictures on yeah. social media or something? Like, what? what is that? What is the point of that? Like, is it like, yeah, we'll, we'll let him know that we loved him anyway. It's like, I don't like... <laughs> no, he's rejected you. Like, move on at this stage, lad. Seriously. And, like, they're representing the fucking country in doing this. We don't support this. We don't stand by this. Like, let him... Like, I don't care if Declan Rice plays for England, but just let him move on gracefully. Like, it's fine. He's made his choice. It's... Dry your eyes, mate. Dry your eyes, John Delaney. <laughs> them, them fucking journalists again, just <laughs> holding on to what they had. <laughs> yeah, let it go. Uh, guys, busy week, uh, of course. Big week for Ireland, not just because of Paddy's Day. It's become tradition. We have the finale of the Six Nations this weekend, so there's only one way we can celebrate. With a big, nervy weekend, we hoped it would be more of a celebration at the start of the tournament. Hasn't really turned out that way. But nonetheless, we will have Kigo back on the line. Neil Keegan of the Couch Pundit Podcast, always entertaining, always gets us like gives us cause for optimism as well. So in, a, in what could be a tough weekend ahead, uh, we'll have Kigo try rally the troops. We're going to be discussing that with him. We're going to be giving our picks for the Premier League and FA Cup for the weekend and we're also going to be quizzing David Kent on the stories he's reported this week he's pulled it back to within two of me so he is in touch and distance again uh, we shall see if he can uh, complete this comeback uh, later on in this show but first we're going to get it kicked off with the sports stories of the week that we want to discuss because we love all the sports guys but we only have a narrow week to discuss it so what we do with the biggest stories that we want to discuss is we put a minute on the clock in theory for each uh, and we pick our five stories that we want to discuss we call the 5-5, five and five, and it is going to get underway now, because in the Champions League, uh, Liverpool and Man City coasted through in the quarterfinals, leaving four English clubs, one Spanish, one Italian, one Dutch, and one Portuguese. Does this make English sides the alpha dogs of Europe again? I mean, yeah, like you could say it this season, yes, technically, because they have half in the top European club competition, but if you look at the bigger picture... Like the last time this happened, 2007, 2008, I think, was it United? The only United won it. And since then, that's the last time an English club, or sorry, Chelsea won it in 2012. That's my bad. Mm. But Spain have won it. Spanish clubs have won it five in a row, seven in the last ten. The last time English teams were out for dogs in Europe was in the 80s or in the 70s when Liverpool went on that run and they won, I think, seven and eight years, seven and nine years. So, yeah, look, this year, and the English media no doubt will paint them as it's the alpha dogs in Europe. But it's like if it's still a Spanish winner, Barcelona come out and win it, that's going to be embarrassing. So I don't know. Uh, I, you, I don't think so personally. What you have to look at is these tournaments are usually won by the team that can devote the most resources towards it. They don't have a league campaign that can rest players at the right time and stuff like that. So for me, I have to look at Barcelona and Juve, two teams, Juve especially, who have their leagues pretty much sewn up. They can play reserve teams in the league and still probably coast through and claim domestic glory. So they can f- field full strength teams, whereas Man City and Liverpool, for example, they don't have that luxury that makes the likes of maybe Spurs if they can pick up a couple of decent wins in the league and consolidate their top four spot that makes them dangerous Man United as well have fourth place to contend for so you have to look out for that as well I think there is more of a story to this I don't think it's just a coincidence in case of lucky draws especially when you look at Liverpool beating Bayern there's no German side in the quarterfinals Germany of course getting four Champions League spots providing no quarterfinalists so you have to look into coefficiency then and if that's fair 
and if there should be another side, if maybe Ajax's performance in getting to the quarters deserves further merit, or maybe the likes of Portuguese side as well, with Porto getting in there, they're regulars at this stage, of getting to this stage of the competition. Um, so yeah, I think there is something to be said. What that is, we don't know. Is the depth of the English Premier League, or at least the, 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 the top of it, stronger than other leagues? Yes, I think so, but we don't know, but I, I think there is something to this. Um, it's just, uh, what that is will play out over the next few weeks. Yeah, of course, the draw coming on Friday as well. It'll be interesting to see if we get an all-English tie. I'm sure mm. like there has to be at this stage. Yeah. Moving on, the past week in the NFL saw three massive moves as Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell swapped the Steelers for the Raiders and Jets respectively, while old Al Beckham Jr. moved to Cleveland. But which of the three biggest moves so far will have the biggest impact for their new side in the new season? This will, this is easy to me. It's OBJ in Cleveland, and it's because he, like, he is surrounding a team that would have contended for the division. The Ravens have lost a lot of their defensive core. The Steelers, of course, have got absolutely savaged here. Uh, their, their policies of trying to protect players and trying to, uh, not overpay them coming back to haunt them. That's what led for Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell. These are both entirely preventable situations from two players who want to play for the Steelers. So they're going to feel that on the back end. It's going to be tough for them to compete. Cleveland Browns have pretty much an open goal now to claim their division and have one of the best wide receivers of their time um, to to do so. Antonio Brown, look, we saw his motives become clear as the summer went on, or sorry, the offseason went on. Um, you know, he's looking for money. He's looking to get paid. That's his priority. Le'Veon Bell, like, if anything, gave up money by not playing last year. I don't think money is his motivation, but he's saying, why would I, like, risk my body, get over overworked in my last year of a contract and not get paid for doing so so he's got a more admirable claim but I don't think the, the Jets are in the division with the Patriots and I don't think Le'Veon Bell brings them up to 9 or 7 or 10 and 6 which is what you're looking at for a wild card spot if they're not going to win the division. The Raiders also win a tough division. They've got the Chargers and they've got the Chiefs so I don't know what they're going to be able to do with Antonio Brown it makes it interesting there if John Gruden can get uh, some interesting offseason acquirements aside from Antonio Brown but I don't, I, I don't see them as contenders. I see Cleveland Browns as like favorites in that division they're going to be in the playoffs next year could be outside uh, outsiders for a Super Bowl shot yeah absolutely I mean the, reun- the reuniting of Beckham Odell Beckham and Jarvis Landry as well from the time at LSU mm. they absolutely tore the college scene to shreds for two or three years and also Baker Mayfield the young quarterback who they can build around as well like with two of the best weapons well at least one of the, one of the top three wide receivers and then probably Landry's in the top ten like, Bell with Darnold, and as you mentioned, the Jets in the Patriots division, that could be interesting, but I'd still be worried about the Jets outside that. And, like, the Raiders are the Raiders, even with Brown. Like, will Brown have the same success rate with Derek Carr as did with Roethlisberger? I don't know. I don't mean, like, it's like the last last season's kind of offseason, the biggest question was, oh, who's Kirk Cousins going to go to? So the fact that we've got these three in the last week, plus a lot more to come. I'm really excited for the new season already. Yeah, it's going to make fantasy leagues an absolute bitch to oh, predict, though. Stop. It's going to make it very interesting. Anyway, moving on. Uh, Jack Grealish was attacked and punched in the head by a Birmingham City fan during last week's Second City Derby with Aston Villa. This marks the third incident within the past few weeks in the UK. Gary Neville has called for the clubs to face deep punishment. Is it fair to blame these incidents on the clubs, though? Uh, yes and no. There's only so much the clubs can do because, as it, like everyone knows, Every football club in the world has a section of morons who will condone this kind of stuff and share this kind of stuff. But, like, they can't... Like, the stewarding maybe probably should have been a bit better. He was able to get a clear run at Grealish. And then, obviously, the later incident with the Birmingham steward where he's been suspended now for kneeing Jack Grealish in the aftermath of his goal. Like, we see these incidents all the time in Scotland. Something has to... There has to be an example made of them at some stage. because Otherwise, like, it will end up with someone getting legitimately hurt at these matches. Grealish... Fair play to him, got straight back up and played on at the composure to score the winner uh, 10 minutes later. Like the likes of well, Neil Lennon in Scotland, even Steve Clark in Scotland, a couple more in the last few months as well. So there's something has to be done. There has to be an example made. It would be like the ideal thing for me would be like it kind of be a staggered system of a stadium ban for the first incident, forfeit the game for the second, and then if it happens again, points deduction. Because fines doesn't do anything with football clubs at the top two levels, from my view. Like, 
the clubs do have to do something themselves to kind of root out this stuff, but it's impossible to track everyone, you know? The fan last week was, uh, I think, sentenced to 14 months in prison. I think that's your way to go about it. I don't know what the clubs can do beyond... I uh, saw an interesting article in The Guardian last week by Bernie Rone uh, saying that, like, recreational drug use at football games has gone up massively over the past few years. So something can be done to tackle that. Again, like, if you have fans mm-hmm. absolutely plastered, you know, you can have that. You can have, like, at an administrative level, uh, like, you can have it be you know do you look at like alcohol bans at the stadium and stuff like that like maybe that could be if for if there's incidents happening uh maybe that could be consequential and then you can have fans police themselves because there's only so much stewards can do especially event stewards like this they're not trained for security we see them running around like headless chickens after these yeah. people not knowing what to do and ultimately as well there's going to be an accident there so that's not a solution i don't think points deduction is a solution because i don't think it's the team's fault that it's happening maybe there's something to do with the club administration but i don't think it's the team's fault so the team shouldn't be punished um and i think that's just a reactionary move by gary neville but i think there there are clever ways to deal with this i think it does need to be dealt with on some level though you're just looking at the volume of incidents in the past few weeks and the fact that it's all happening in the, in the uk isn't great either so that's pointed to something else again barney rone's article was like is this symptomatic of society as a whole with football just yes. being one representation of society is this just telling a story about british society which we we saw that with hooliganism in the past and so on, where football is just kind of uh, the, the window where we look into this unpleasant corner of society. So it's an interesting one. I think stuff can be done, but I think talking about points deductions and the likes of that, I don't think that's going to make much of a difference. These fans are absolutely off their face. Like, deal with that first before, like, they're not going to care about, like, oh, we get we lose three points in a crucial relegation race when they're off their tits on coke. Like, that's not what's yeah. going through their yeah, head. Um, so there needs to be smarter... Um, uh, more socially based uh, solutions to be found for this, from my opinion. Fair enough. Um, after an absolute clusterfuck which started back at the end of the World Cup, Real Madrid went back to what they knew when they appointed Zinedine Zidane as their new boss during the week following the Champions League exit to Ajax. Could Zizou have held out for a better job or is this the right move for him at this stage? It's a tough one. Like, What, what better job is there in world football than Real Madrid? Like... I, I can't think of many like it's you know what I mean yeah you're coming in and the locker room is a bit like uh, is a bit all over the place because Zidane left last season but now he's coming back to solve it like you have unlimited financial resources you have Zinedine Zidane as well like what a great position he was in he left because he lost power for example you're talking about uh, he wanted to sell Gareth Bale instead of Ronaldo uh, Ronaldo was sold behind his back so he's like alright well look there's only one way I can deal with this now um, so so again, like he he he's got the power that he needs now to like for for staffing and for player decisions and stuff like that. So I don't know if there's much better jobs than Real Madrid. Like you look at them and yeah, they're they're form, but form is temporary, class is permanent. And like yeah, it's, like already talk of them bringing in a Cardi Hazard. Like I think Real Madrid are going to be just fine. I think they're just a reactionary club with uh, impatient fans and an absolutely savage local media scene. But I think. Real Real Madrid are fine. They've had one bad season where they didn't win the Champions League. Boo fucking you. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's not, it's not a crisis as we know it, you know? I think I think this was as good a move as any that Zidane could have made. Yeah, and like the only thing that really got in line was like, what more could he do having won three Champions Leagues? And maybe... Maybe they just want them to actually now do the opposite and just win leagues instead, win the domestic trophy again. And just not like... Champions League, look, we already have 13 of them, so... Like just get us, just get us back to the top table. Like there was talks of maybe the PSG job coming or even Bayern, but like I think Zidane's happy. I think Madrid are happy until they sell someone again behind his back next season. It'll all be fine. Yeah, and, and look, Madrid will always spoil towards this. They're a hot mess of a club, and look, that's why we find them entertaining. So, uh, yeah, there will be a future uh, thing. But also, as well, it's like the Arsenal job last year. Teams that are spiraling are great to manage because yeah. you, you also manage the expectations of what of what you need to do to be considered a, a success. He doesn't need to win three Champions Leagues in a row. He's already got that bag. So, uh, I, I think it's a decent move for him. Anyway, last but not least, Conor McGregor was arrested and could face charges of up to 15 years but probably won't in in truth, after taking and smashing a fan's phone in Miami. We've seen him thrive career-wise despite previous criminal activity. Will this incident harm his career in any tangible way? Can't see it. Personally, the OC will market him regardless because he's their cash cow, so 
his next fight, which reportedly was confirmed during the week, but like then he got arrested again. Like considering the stuff he's been arrested for in the past and his alleged activities as well, like the fact he still has a career is questionable. Like if he was any other, if he was Joe Soap on the edge of the street, he'd be in jail for the last 10, 15 years. The fact that he's a superstar means he isn't. So like I don't see a harm in his career in any way. He'll be back fighting whenever he, whenever the UFC want him to. So. No, he still have his fans. He still have his defenders. He still have his fighting ability. So until he retires, and or unless he actually ends up behind bars for something, no. The difference between this and uh, what we've seen in the past is when we've seen the criminal incidents in the past, Conor McGregor was winning. Conor McGregor was there were super fights being talked about with Floyd Mayweather and Khabib Nurmagomedov uh, being spoken about. Now he's talking about fighting Donald Cerrone. Who I love Donald Cerrone. Great fighter, really entertaining, yeah. great personality, but at the same time, not a super fight. He is on the tail end of his career. His weaknesses yeah. and vulnerabilities have been seen. So this stuff I think does hurt him in a in a tangible way. But also, I don't think it's going to affect his like this is a very uh, I do struggle sometimes to figure out like because when history's happening around us, we don't know how to contextualize it because we don't understand what the big picture is. That you usually unveils itself after a while. I don't think it's going to hurt his core fan base because I think it's telling a depressing story that we see with the likes of Donald Trump that these scumbags can do what they want and unfortunately we see there is a scummy element out there who will follow them and support them and maybe like them even more because they're doing this stuff. So I don't think it's going to affect his image with his hardcore fan base. I think he's going to continue to sell whiskey. I think he's going to continue to make money regardless of himself um, and I think that, that like this actually appeals to his core fan base. So I don't think it's going to hurt him i don't think it's going to help him inside the octagon but i think he's winding down there anyway like i think now the, the mystique has, gro- has worn off we've seen him lose we've seen him beatable uh, and we've kind of seen through the cracks but his core fan base will be there and unfortunately they spend money trying to be like him so uh, that's kind of depressing and, and symptomatic at the times but these are the times that we live in regardless anyway look on to less depressing news <laughs> about how shit society has become. Let's talk about how class rugby is because we have a grandstand finale weekend for the Six Nations and there is only one man we could get on on Paddy's New Yacht to discuss it all. So we are going to call him up now. Ladies and gentlemen from the Couch Pundit Podcast, it is none other than Neil Keegan. Kigo, a few weeks ago on the show, we had you on to preview the Six Nations as a whole and... I think that interview is going to be very different to this one because, I don't know, not that it's gone badly. We like The dangers that you spoke about have unfortunately come to pass, but it's been more of a slog than the previous years we've enjoyed with the Six Nations. How have you been coping with it all? I, I'm glad you're still here. I'm glad your heart has been able to take <laughs> it. But uh, how have you been dealing with it? It's been, it's, been a, it's been a bit of a slog, more of a slog than we would have expected. Well, we've we've upped the uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, lads. How are you? Uh, we are upping the Prozac dosage, which is how <laughs> we're getting through this. Um, we kind of we kind of strolled merrily in like the Fonz in Happy Days, if you pardon the age reference. <laughs> Leather jacket, bit of confidence, very tight trousers, uh, and then uh, the English arrived and. Unfortunately, we're going to. I, I don't know what the language rules are here with you guys. Go but for it. We're gonna. All right, we're gonna have to eat a little bit of shit on the first game for a long time. You know mm. what the English are like. Yeah. I heard they won the World Cup in 1966. <laughs> they don't mention it, so so it's handy. But um, it wasn't. It wasn't just that we were beaten. We were smashed up, and it was upsetting. Uh, we we always start slow in everything we do, whether it's love making or the Six Nations, and so, um, so speak for yourself. Try... <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the next podcast. You know what I mean? It's like getting the, getting the job done quick, but because um, the ads are on. But anyway, sorry. Enough about my personal life. Um, but yeah, the game was done, and we're all very upset. And we thought, as professional people, you guys know yourselves. Whatever the sport is, losing happens. It's a matter of how you deal with it, how you navigate it. And I, the worrying thing is not the results. The worrying thing is that it took or it is taking such a long time to get over that first loss. I know there's injuries and stuff like that. But where we're sitting today, if, if we'd have said, walked in and said, right, if we'd have had good performances with one loss, we'd be sitting here going, that's all right. We can handle that. Mm. But it was just the fact that it's taken so long to come back from that or we're not back yet from that English loss. That's that's the worry going ahead 
into into Cardiff who are there's money on for the double for Wales, the World Cup and the Six Nations. Ooh. And that's not that's not bad money. Oh, I like that. It's an interesting call. That is not bad money. Well, yeah, uh, let's let, let's get optimistic because we're in the situation that we're in, and it's not the worst situation. There is a scenario where we could walk out. We could still walk out with the Six Nations in theory. It's there's long odds. Let's call the spade a spade here. But there is a scenario where, and there is cause for optimism because we face a, a well side who have navigated every game so far. But none in a convincing fashion. Like they're they're winning, they are doing enough to win. And you know, we we always talk about, especially with football, we're like that's how champions win games. You know, they win it, they slug it out, they win the tough games, but they make sure they get the win. So they deserve credit for that. But yet, for example, they've yet to pick up a bonus point. They haven't been winning. They haven't been absolutely hockeying teams in the same way we've seen England do it. In the same way we did to France last week. Uh, Wales had no uh, like Wales is more of a struggle against France. So th- does this speak more to the grit of Warren Gatland's men? their determination to win in spite of themselves do it for the coach in his last year or does it reveal that maybe they're more vulnerable and not Grand Slam quality is there is there cause for optimism somewhere there looking in the, the lack of convincingness of the Welch's wins well I think I, I we're, we were never as good as we thought we were and we're not as bad as people think we are yeah. you know yourselves the internet yeah. is a horrible place uh, it, where people can express their opinions some people who shouldn't be allowed out the front door are able to express their opinions, uh, myself included, probably. But the 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 the, the backlash to the, the first game was a bit overboard, and I think it's just it's a bit worrying that we're we're rolling in here with such uncertainty. Now the the, the good thing, get the good thing about Gatland is he's so petty. <laughs> yeah. He's so he's so kind of you said this about me in 1985, and I'm going to get you for it now in 2019. You know what I mean? He's got yeah. that. He's able to galvanise that team who are playing rubbish in terms of club rugby. It's The arse has fallen out of Welsh club rugby. and But he's able to navigate this team, put them together in, in a way where, yeah, yeah, no bonus points, but they've won every game. One game at a time, and you're going to win everything. You can't, we can win, and that's not, that's not me being like, oh, it's Paddy's weekend, we'll all be pissed, we can do anything. It's like, we can, if Ireland show up and do what they do, they'll win. Mm. That's yeah. Some done it for awful. You could have put up the room by the drawn with that. Awful. They were so bad. So we can't. Sorry, Kigo. We're actually losing you. We're getting. We're going to give you a call back. Uh, we're losing you there. Uh, give me two seconds, and I give yes, you. Yes, it ring went back. well for us. Uh, all right, guys, we're back. We uh, we had a Facebook had a bit of a meltdown. It's acting up this week, so uh, we do have Kigo back on the line. There, you you were saying about uh, Warren Gatlin's man. Apologies for losing you there. No worries, apologies there. Uh, as I was trying to say, I think my Fitbit interfered with the Wi-Fi. It says I've been masturbating for fourteen miles today. So, <laughs> so, uh, so apologies for that. I'm a little bit out of breath as well. So, you know, you know yourself. It's uh, cardio in the home. It's a new fitness uh, routine those, those, that I'm developing. Those technical issues came at a very convenient time. It seems. <laughs> So uh, we were yeah, talking I'm, about I'm, Warren Gatland's men, though he is—he's kind of grind. He's getting them to grind it out, and and, and they're playing. They're playing above <laughs> themselves. Oh, absolutely. Sorry, I, I don't know if, when when I got cut off, but I was talking about the bitterness of Warren Gatland. Yeah, if we got that far. Yeah. And how, <clears throat> excuse me, and how he uh, he's able to channel a team that aren't performing at any other level um, in terms of their club. The arse has fallen out of Welsh rugby. It's uh, it's a tragic comedy if you if you read about what's happening over there. But he's able to do it. He's able to understand. He's he's very much, uh, you know, you're you're a football man. He's he's very much like a an Alex Ferguson. He's an mm. organizer, whereas he's got a team around him who are doing the nuts and bolts coaching. So it's very regimented. The guys know what they're doing, when they're doing it, how they're supposed to do it. It hasn't been spectacular for them. I think there's pressure on them. They're going for this uh, record of of longest winning streak as well, like we had, like England had recently. Um, they're great to watch. They're they're a good strangler team. If you look at what they did to England, mm. after England beat us, they spent a week in Portugal saying, "Once we beat Ireland, we can beat everyone." And that you, that logic doesn't work in sports. So they they obviously, if we don't want to talk about it, they came here and won. But then um, they thought they were going to do the same to Wales, and Wales just stood there like a big red wall and strangled them towards the end. And now England can't recover from that mentally. 
or emotionally because that's what they can't do. Yeah. But Wales, on the other hand, they are they're strong, they're confident, they're playing in their in their back garden. Um, the 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 only thing that we have going for ourselves, I was just looking at the stats before I was talking to you guys, and in uh, in Wales we've played fifty nine times, we've only won twenty, they've won thirty seven, oh. and we've only drawn twice. We've scored five hundred and ninety nine points, they've scored eight hundred and one. Oh. <laughs> so you kind of go right. I know stats don't win games, and it's just something to sound intelligent on the radio, but. <laughs> The, the history is there where we struggle in Cardiff. Mm. Now, we've got to remember the big nights we've had. We yeah. went there in 09. Um, we've had decent wins against them in the last little while. But they've also they've also put scores on us. Like, I was just, again, looking past it. We've, you know, 2014, we won 26-3 at home. Uh, but they've, won, they've won the two journeys to Cardiff since uh, 2019. So, uh, in the last five head-to-head. So, we're... <sighs> it's head and heart stuff. Yeah, this is it. it. But look, it's said that like Ireland get better over a Six Nations. Like it's it's always even if you look at last year, which we consider a massive success, was only the Grand Slam was only enabled because of a late Johnny Sexton uh, field goal in the last minute against France. Otherwise, no Grand Slam in the first game. But then we got better and better and better. And look at sorry, last, what what's a what's a what's a field a drop goal, goal sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Rick. <laughs> rookie Jesus. error, rookie error, and slip of the tug. <laughs> um, late drop goal from Johnny Sexton. Otherwise, no Grand Slam. But, like, this year, you look at last week against France, for example. We were able to impose our will. We went in needing a bonus point win. We imposed our will upon France. I think a lot of the criticism was harsh against Italy. It was an away game. It was difficult for us to perform. Italy have played better. Like, this is the, this is the secret that no one wants to talk about. Italy have played better than people have given them credit for against everyone this season so they rose their performance against us but we still got the bonus point win we needed so uh, is there like uh, last week for example we only took our foot off the gas and like made the score respectable for France when we had the job done when the win was in the bag so is there reasons to feel positive here for us like could, we could go out and get a scalp here you know ultimately we're probably not going to win with the way the dynamic is we're probably not going to win the Six Nations as a whole but we could get a scalp here I, I think there's more to this than just like you know, we've seen what Wales can do, but we've also not seen them win convincingly. If we go out and impose our will, like you said, we should win. Can we be optimistic, or should we be cautious going into Saturday? Hundred percent, we can be optimistic. We can we we, we can be realistic as well. Like mm. I think, I think the issues going in the the, the Scotland the Wales game. Scotland was a bit better, but but or Scotland and Italy. Sorry, we just didn't perform in Italy. We still won. Now Wales didn't get a bonus point, so you know what I mean. It's it's all swings and roundabouts. You can, you can. I think when it's over, we can look at it as a as a whole tournament. Mm. If we look at it as game by game, which is what we're doing at the moment until it finishes, it, it's we started slow again, mm. and we, we usually the kind of build up after that happens much quicker, and it just hasn't. Now we've got a bonus point against France. How many times in the hundred years we've been playing France have we gotten a bonus point yeah. or scored twenty six points? Not many times. Yeah. So a lot of positivity. But now is the time, we keep saying it, but now is the time we have to, it's not just about Six Nations and all this sort of stuff. We we have to win. We have to make Wales not want to see a green jersey ever again. Yeah. And that's a, whether we, the Six Nations and the trophies and all that, don't worry about that. That's Win the game and go from there. If we win, England are probably going to win it. It doesn't matter. Mm. We have to put in a shift. We have to put in a performance. And the the squad's being announced this afternoon. The, some of the changes that have been leaked out are very strong. We need to start quick. It's a bit like any scrap you've ever been in in your life, from the playground up to outside, outside Buskers and Temple Bar. <laughs> you have to start quick and and put put your get your message across very fast. And that's what Ireland need to do. And look, it's what we did against France last week. We needed to get 100%. the job done straight away. Boom, try. So, I don't know. I, I think we can be optimistic. There was an article in the Irish Times during the week, very interesting, that spoke about how World Cup momentum is overblown. Ultimately, we're six months away from the tournament in Japan. So, is that is there something to be said to that? that like, maybe we do read too much into the performance in the Six Nations, as, uh, but historically also, like, it's hard to ignore because of how Ireland have been. Like, we... 
we peaked the year before our World Cup and it's happening again. So it is tough for us to ignore because we're seeing it happen before our eyes. But is there is is it overblown? Is the idea of World Cup momentum overblown when you consider we may have uh, like not a completely different squad, but we may have a different looking squad then to the squad we have now when you take injuries and young players come into the fore into the fa- in, into factor as well. Absolutely yes and no. If Ireland were winning the Six Nations yeah. and going for a Grand Slam, <laughs> the same journalist would be saying it, it, momentum is yeah. important. So, you know what I mean? They're, they're playing a game as well. Um, obviously, if we were sitting here with, with the wins leading up to, go, to Wales, we'd be saying, this is fantastic. But you've also got to learn about yourself and about your team and, and what fear does to you. And I think, I think that's what we're finding out and I think that's what the lads are finding out. There was a fear after that England game that the wheels could fall off this mm. uh, and I think we all felt that and verbalised it in different ways but I think the lads in the tra- in, in the squad I think that the coaching staff with everything leading up to this is Joe's last season and all this sort of stuff it all it all pinpointed on that one game and it didn't work for us mm. and I think fear has gotten into us now and I think we're starting to come out of it I just I thought we were a bit I thought we were stronger than allowing this fear to get in. You guys know, whatever your sport is, when you lose, it's all about your next play, your next goal, your next minute. It took Ireland a little while to get to the France performance. Mm. Um, Now, there's a lot to work on, but Wales have stuff to work on as well. They've just been the United team of the 90s where they're going to West Brom and winning 1-0 in the rain. You know what I mean? Mm. Wales are doing that. Ireland can beat Wales. Ireland are better all around the pitch in 13 positions. They're better. Ireland need to start like they did against France. We need to get that scrap started quick. Mm. And it's it's a big thing. I, I, you talk about the beautiful game of rugby and how it's skill and all. It's a team-based combat sport. And whoever lands that first punch, whoever gets that person going backwards first, is going to have a better chat very, very quickly. So... If they kick to us, we have to catch and charge straight into them. We have to do what we do and what Leinster do. We have to throw in a couple of long phase plays where you kind of got 30 phases where they have to tackle us, test the wind of the Welsh like we did against France. In fairness to the French, French, they had fitness that they don't usually have. Mm. Let's see what Wales have. Let's see if they're up for the scrap. It's it's a long tournament, and of course it takes its toll as well as as Scotland are finding out right now. Which the thing is for us, like in preparing ourselves mentally for this weekend, because as you say, look, it's all going to be one out in the field, and it's going to be one in the early exchanges, and it's going to be one by who wakes up, who has their ready break that morning, you know, who's who's feeling, you know, who's feeling it on the day, and that's why we love sport ultimately when it, when contests are these close to call. But the thing is, in mentally preparing ourselves, it's kind of all out of our control because even if we do get the job done here to take home to take home the Six Nations we need Scotland to pull off an upset against England that they frankly haven't looked capable of this entire tournament and now injuries are taking their toll on the Scots on top of everything else so like is our best realistic hope to just be spoilers for Wales here and to hand the trophy to England realistically I, th- I think we, we need to stop thinking about anybody else yeah. I, I, like, it's in, it, there's a chance you know what I mean there's a chance that I could fly to the moon you know what I mean it's a very slim chance, but there's a chance there anyway. It's a weird analogy, but you know, um, I, I haven't had my coffee and I'm a bit tired, as we mentioned earlier on. That's but uh, forget about forget about England, forget about Wales, forget about everybody else, and who's who's going to lift the trophy. It's one game at a time, and we have to put in the shift here this week. If we like, if we win and every, all the permutations and combinations happen, and William Wallace comes back and they beat they beat England, and we win the Six Nations. What have we really learnt? Like we've won it because yeah. of somebody else, as yeah. opposed to winning it ourselves. So we have to get in there and and beat Wales first of all, and then just turn the telly off. Yeah. It doesn't matter who raises the trophy. Yeah. You know, we we need that gold trophy. Uh, you know, in the summer, we don't need this one. We need we need the performance, like you're saying. We need to. We really need to set a marker down, and it's it's, it's kind of the the emotional Thursday is hitting me now, just mm. before the teams are are selected. You've got a. It's head versus heart, and it's always, you know, I always go with my heart. I, I think, I think we we are annoyed and angry enough to start the way we should start. I think there's enough skill, and if you look at, uh, for example, the Keith Earls try last week, which is rugby pornography. <laughs> if you're watching it in slow motion, there's France don't know which of four players are going to get the ball, mm. 
And so if you can do that to any team in any sport, you have a shot. So the, the, that was the one trick that came in last week. There are tricks that are being saved for the for the World Cup. Things like Johnny's starting to pass a little bit earlier, which is confusing more people that he didn't do in the first three games. So we're starting to add little bits and pieces that Wales haven't seen. Wales aren't going to do anything we haven't seen. Mm. They're not going to do anything different because they're so good at what they do. So I think I think we need... I'm looking forward to it far, far too much. It's going to be a savage scrap. Ireland are going to win, but it's going to be tighter than a duck's arse. So it's going to be it's going to be tight. <laughs> Head if versus, you pardon the mental imagery. Head versus heart. Like, look, we and this is why we get you on because you're somebody who always speaks in the heart, and you get us geed up for the games. Like, I can't wait. Even if we go out and get hockeyed, I'll go into it fucking amped after this conversation. So thank you for that. Always appreciate your chats. But uh, like, you engage your heart so much. Now I'm going to ask you to engage your head. Who's walking away with the Six Nations on Saturday? Who do you think? Logically, using all your rugby knowledge, who do you think is walking away? Who's taking the title on Saturday? Do you think Wales are getting a Grand Slam? Do you think England are coming in? Or are, are you still? Are you going to go with your heart and think a miracle is going to happen? I think, I think we're going to beat Wales. I think England are going to bonus mm-hmm. point Scotland, yeah. and I'm going to turn the television off. Yeah. <laughs> and get on with my life. Yeah, look, if if that happens, that's fine. Because, like, look, hey, we can't win everything. And like you say, the important thing is the Grand Slam. But if that wins, we've got a lot to be... If that happens, we've got a lot to be positive about. So that's not a loss. Like, we went out on a high as best we could after the first weekend. 100%. All right, Kigo, look, enjoy your weekend. And uh, you can check out Kigo's thoughts on the Couch Pundit podcast. New end, new one went up this morning as well, or was it last night? So you've got a new one looking at the Six Nations more in depth as well. You cover Leaving Neverland as well. So that's uh, always interesting to get your your opinions on social media. <laughs> you, 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 yeah. you, you don't pull your punches anyway. So <laughs> we, always enjoyable. Check that out on uh, all good podcasting uh, apps, etc. Uh, Kigo, always a pleasure to talk to you and look hopefully we'll be celebrating our points at the weekend we'll see, we shall no see worries, how it goes All right. have a good weekend uh, likewise same to yourself let's hope cheers, our hearts Kigo. Take cheers. It. <laughs> see you lads so look there's Kigo talking fully from the heart love it so amped up Kento you're the voice of reason here you're the logical guy you're the guy who's looking at all the stats and looking at yeah. everything and trying to win money on it all so break all that down using what we've just heard using the research you've put in give us what you think is going to happen this weekend and Anaka look Kigo made a couple of brilliant points in there one Welsh club, Welsh club rugby is indeed a mess but that suits Warren and Gatlin because it means everyone's focused on the international team. Even as players, they're all focused on that. They want to get away from their clubs and now they want everything. Like Gatland is leaving. Schmidt is leaving. Gatland's going for his third Grand Slam with Wales. Ireland only have three in their history. Yeah. That's how much of a legacy he's going to leave. He will want to leave in style. And Kigo, I like, I like how he says well, like he, we should go all hell to the medal and try and get early, early tries. I don't think that'll work. But I also don't think that Joe will care about where the trophy ends up. He just wants a bit of a performance that he can work on towards September. Look, look, if England win the Six Nations, which I personally don't think they will, they're going to be too cocky going into September. It happened the last time, mm. and they went out in the group stage. If Wales win, we'll now have to play against the defensive sides in the, six, in the World Cup in September. So we're going to learn something. Ireland have never lost a final Six Nations game under Schmidt. So in his in his literal final Six Nations game, it'd be kind of a kind of a bad one just to leave till the end. But they also haven't won in Cardiff under him either. Wales will starve us out if we do what England did. I don't think we're going to win. I am going again with my head over my heart. I think Wales they like they've shown that they know how to play against every kind of team in the Six Nations so far. They're able to win ugly. They're able to win without getting a bonus point. Like I don't think they're going to get a bonus point. I'm going for Wales by one to five. I think it's going to be a very tight game. They're always tight between Gatlin, Stein and Irish. But I can't see Ireland win. I don't think that's going to be too heartbreaking for anyone. Mm, yeah, it, it, it is what it is. Look, we, we're yeah. expecting it at this stage, so... Um, as hard, like as as tough as it is to admit, uh, like with the high that we had last November, we do have to take a look at what this tournament has meant to us. So yeah, it's a tough one. Yeah, but again, I don't think that's a bad place to be. And I think if we'd come in and storm the Six Nations, we would have been in for a hiding in September when mm. South Africa took us out in the quarters. They might still do that, but now at least we know. Right, we do have stuff to work on. We're not this invincible machine that people were talking about. 
uh, before the tournament. Elsewhere, I'm kind of looking at Italy and France. They're always tight enough games in Rome. I don't really like the French on the handicap ever with anyone because they're just so hot and cold. So I'm going to go for under 50 points total in the game. Like, Italy have won twice against France and Rome in the last decade. They've only won three times against France in their history. So they have a bit of form against them, but they're always tight enough games. It's never, it's never your 64-10s or your, your 57-24. It's always really like 28-10, 28-14. And then Scotland and England, look, I, I think everyone kind of figures out that England are going to win. They might get a bonus point. I'm going looking for Scotland on the handicap of plus 18 because I think Scotland have a performance in them still in the Six Nations. We haven't seen it yet. We haven't seen this dynamic Scottish future that people are all excited about in a few years. That next will be like last season, obviously last year, Scotland came into the Six Nations and kind of like everyone's like, well, look, there is something here. They haven't shown it in this year yet. Mm. They're due a performance and who went in to do it against in England, you know? So put them all together, Scotland plus 18, under 50 in Rome, and Wales by 1-5. to five. Comes in at about 12-1, to one, which is what my, my Six Nations ACA two weeks ago landed. So nice. Trying to look and finish on a five. Okay, interesting. There, we shall uh, we shall see Saturday. Again, this is all just talk getting us hyped up. It's one on the field, and especially when the margins are this tight, we just don't know. I think England I think England are walking away with it, though, uh, personally. I just, it just feels like that, even if they're, yeah. even if they're getting a, a, another bonus point and doing it that way. We shall see. Anyway, look, guys, that's the rugby. We're going to talk about the football now, uh, because another big weekend, Premier League and the FA Cup, we're going to be giving our predictions for both. In the prediction league, you only have to worry about the Premier League though we will have that up on Twitter from around 6 o'clock tonight if you haven't played the Prediction League before and want to get involved make your football weekend a bit more interesting all you have to do is get onto the Paddy's New Yacht Twitter see our pinned tweet when it goes up later this evening give your picks for the weekend's Premier League games give us a correct score and an anytime goal scorer if you get the correct outcome you get one point if you get the correct score you get three points if your anytime goal scorer scores you get two points there is monthly and yearly competitions though it's March so if you're in the year competition you're probably not going to win at this stage but yeah. there is still monthly prizes to be won a subscription to low blows vod so get on that we uh wanted to play along and we have to uh but it's not fair if we win all the time so we put a handicap on ourselves so our predictions uh as soon as we say them on this show on thursday you guys have until saturday morning as soon as we say them on thursday they are locked in even if we're anytime goal scores go down an injury that is tough luck so we shall see starting with the Premier League fixtures for the weekend. Bournemouth against Newcastle kicks us off on Saturday 3pm. The early is in the FA Cup, so these are all bet safe games. And Bournemouth fucked over my ACA last week by, shock mm. horror, winning away, even if it was against Huddersfield. Um, Eddie Howe he's going to use that as motivation to galvanise the troops for a tricky visit of, Newca- of a Newcastle side coming off a high themselves. But stop for a second and think about this. Yes, Newcastle's 3-2 comeback win over Everton was great, but we also saw last week our cup final logic pay dividends when we warned you about Man United after their win over PSG, even if we didn't take our own advice and back Arsenal to win there. And there's been comparisons about Newcastle's match. This is what made me laugh and made me think, nope, I'm looking out for this now. There's been comparisons to Liverpool winning in Istanbul when they came back against an out-of-sorts Everton who are 11th in the team, comparing it to the Champions League final of 2005, one of the most legendary matches ever. So I think Newcastle uh, are like they're, they're in no for a comeback down to earth. And they're also sneakily poor away from home this season. Not as bad as Bournemouth mind but that's not the question here so I'm going for Bournemouth to continue their winning streak I'm going for 2-0 with Wilson to score yeah look Bournemouth you mentioned it snapped a six game winless run by picking up to by picking up to Huddersfield Claxton and kept a clean sheet thanks to future Cork City star Asmir Begovic <laughs> I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to that later on it's rare that you would say Newcastle are in the better form against anyone, but as you mentioned, the impressive come from behind victory against Everton as Raffles men could actually go above the cherries with a win here the problem is that only the big six have been better on their own turf than stupid sexy Eddie Howe this year. Mm. Newcastle have the fourth West have the fourth worst offense in the league, but Bournemouth have the fourth West defense. I'm going to use FMQ here and call it a two-all draw on Callum Wilson because 
fuck it, why not? Okay, interesting. I think any outcome is possible in this. It's one yeah. of those proper tricky Saturday mid- 3 p.m. kickoffs. Another one that could be tricky is Burnley against Leicester. And you don't get points for being plucky, as both of these sides have learned in recent weeks. Burnley gave Liverpool a scare last week, but their 4 2 loss, their third in the bounce in the league, saw them drift back to 17th, just two points off the drop. They badly need a win here to alleviate the pressure, but the problem is Brendan Rodgers' magic seems to be working at Leicester, with even Jamie Vardy back among the goals last, in last week's win over Fulham. The good news is that for Burnley is that Cardiff don't play this week, so whatever happens, they won't end up in the re- relegation zone, but the bad news is I think that'll be taken out of their hands as they're going to lose here as I'm picking Leicester to eke it out. 2-1, Verdi to score again. Yeah, look, it's all gone wrong for Sean Dyche since beating Spurs. They've shipped nine goals in those three defeats, replying with just three of themselves. And even more worryingly, they still have to play Chelsea, City and Arsenal. Oh. But as you mentioned, because Cardiff have the weekend off, they won't drop into the bottom three yet. Regardless of the result against the rejuvenated Leicester with the new manager bounce. I say rejuvenated. They won last week, but yeah. that didn't happen very often under Claude Well, So, yeah, rise the standard. <laughs> That showed that Leicester struggled badly in the opening 15 minutes. Over half their goals conceded have come in the first half, while Burnley have the same problem in the last 15 minutes, conceding 16 goals so far this season. On average, both teams have scored in 67% of these games. I'll go for that in a clinical Foxes win because... Well, Leicester are higher on the table in this sense, and they're playing better football, so 3-1, Jamie Vardy. Last Saturday, Premier League game, West Ham face Huddersfield, and we just don't know what West Ham team is showing up week to week at this stage. They kept it tight in a loss to City, they beat Newcastle impressively, and then they got humbled by Cardiff. Who the fuck knows? Fortunately, it doesn't matter, uh, because they face the visit of a Huddersfield side we know exactly what to expect from. Nothing. Nothing. The win over Wolves was an anomaly, as it turns out, and they couldn't even take advantage of Bournemouth's bleak away record last week. So give me West Ham 2-0 here, with Declan Rice flying high with confidence after the week he's had and celebrating with a goal. Yeah, look, West Ham are inconsistent. They were humbled a bit by Cardiff, but come on, it's Huddersfield. You might be able to talk me around because West Ham conceded 8% of their home games until I see the Terriers haven't found the net in their last five games away from home. Don't be stupid. 3-0. And if Felipe Anderson doesn't score against Huddersfield, he's getting sold in the summer. Why do you keep betting on the person that isn't scoring the score? Like, you're betting on someone... That's one of our. That's one of our gambling rules. Don't bet on something because it's due to happen. And you keep doing it. I'm not it. saying he's due. I'm not saying he's due. I'm saying if he can't score against fucking Huddersfield, there's no hope for him. You're, I won't predict him again after this weekend if he doesn't score. You're betting him every week, and it's not working for you. <laughs> Moving on to the... Yeah, sun- and the week, that, the, week, the week that I don't bet on him, you know what's going to happen. It's like you with the Spurs draw. Because he's due to I'll, score? Because pre- it's I'll, due to I'll happen? Predict, Mish- I'll predict Michelle and Anto- Mikael Antonio to score and fucking Anderson will get a hat. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> That's such a fallacy. That is how people lose money right there. You are not listening to yourself here. Uh, moving on to Sunday, the Premier League action. Fulham against Liverpool. And the Liverpool side riding high. 99 undefeated and having seen off Bayern in the Champions League travel to a miserable Fulham side who've lost their last six and have one foot in the Championship. There is a world where liverpool Lightus kicks in at the same time as new manager Bounce does. And look, we've seen Fulham put it up to both Spurs and Chelsea at home in recent weeks too. But they lost both of those games. And a key component of liverpool Lightus involves Liverpool taking their form for granted. They're one point behind in the title race and can get the psychological boost of an extended run at the top with a win here as City are on FA Cup duty, of course, this week. So Klopp won't let them get cocky at this stage. They can't afford to. I think it could be nervy and tight like those aforementioned Fulham games, though. So give me Liverpool winning 2-1 with Mane to score. He's on fire this season. Yeah, Liverpool, very professional Munich, and one without really getting out of second gear. Like, as you mentioned, the nine unbeaten domestically, stark contrast to the Codgers, who are waving the white flag after another defeat to Leicester. I really thought about using Liverpool like this, but I just can't with Fulham, or even cup final celebrations after midweek. Like, mm. But I just can't. Um, although it would be possibly the funniest thing ever <laughs> if this is where the challenge starts to unravel. Because it is happening soon. I said it last week and got found out badly by me. I can't do it this week, so it just be more perfectly. But I'm going for 2-0. I'm going to go for Milner from the penalty spot because it's full. 
Okay, interesting. Last Premier League game of the week, Sunday, half four, Everton against Chelsea in the Sheen. A motivation that seemed to come with the Carabao Cup final drama seems to have worn off for Chelsea. They were lucky to have even gotten a point against Wolves last week in goal scorer. Eden Hazard's head is reportedly turning back towards Madrid now that Zidane is back. Everton, meanwhile, will be pissed about losing against Newcastle last week, and as we saw against Liverpool, can make life tough for big clubs when the cameras are on. You see results like that happen, and you think back to Southampton a couple of weeks ago losing to Man United they came out and then beat Spurs that's another rule we need to consider adding teams that are pissed off it happens quite a lot I think all of this points towards an upset here we've seen before the effects of Sarri ball can wear off quickly and dramatically so let's not forget Chelsea's absolute horrors away from home earlier in the season I'm going to go for it I'm picking Everton to win 2-1 here I'm picking Sigurdsson score and I don't feel that like I don't feel it's that ballsy of a pick Fair enough. I mean, it was classic. Everton beat Cardiff, rise up to almost snatch a win against your biggest rivals, save a penalty, score, and, and then immediately score in the next minute, and then fuck it all away to lose 3-2 last week yeah. against Newcastle. That draw against Liverpool is Everton's only point in the last three home games, but the thing is, Chelsea aren't that great on the road either. Their win against Fulham the last time round was nervy, and they snapped a three-game winless run, including those trashings to Bournemouth and City. But then they struggled last week against Wolves. They needed Hazard to rescue them in injury time again. The thing is, United and Arsenal both have the week off. So Chelsea will go forth with a win, in, and this is their game in hand, isn't it? I think. So I can see that being enough to focus Sarri's men against a potentially sticky opponent. It's one of those games where like, people are saying everything could win as an upset, or maybe even as not an upset, but this is one that they never really do. And I'm going to go for 3-1 with Chelsea, with Higuain to score. Okay. But I can, like, I could, you could talk me into an Everton result. I just I can't say that they're going to do it with confidence. Okay, moving on to the FA Cup picks for the weekend. Remember, guys, you do not have to worry about these games. We're just picking it for fun and for gambling purposes, too. So, starting with Watford against Crystal Palace. Uh, it's the early game, but I don't know. Can we bet on the early in the FA Cup? Like, what's the story we need, here? We need another theme tune for the FA Cup special. Yeah, I, I don't know if yeah, I don't. I think I think it's okay to bet on the early in the FA Cup. I don't know. There hasn't been enough data on this. We haven't had. We don't do many FA Cup backers, so we don't know how the FA Cup affects the early game. And this is just a lack of fuck of a game anyway. So that's the problem there. It's a sneakily tasty tie when trying to pick a winner. Or both sides capable of great performances, but both also coming off bad losses last week following impressive wins. The only part where it isn't tasty. On the pitch, unfortunately. A running team of both sides run to the quarterfinals has been clean sheets. Neither has conceded a goal yet in this competition this year so far. So fuck it. I'm going for the ballsy pick here. I'm predicting both to keep their records with a nil-all draw and give me Palace on penalties because why not? Look, we've a side threat to be brought into a relegation scrap. I could do with a break later on the season. I guess a guaranteed mid-table side which the FA Cup represents their only shot at silverware. The Hornets did a double over Roy Hodgson's men already in the league season, but Palace play much better on the road. Mm. My gut instinct also says extra time and potentially penalties, but I'm going to go with my head and use the eye testing on Watford 2-1 with Dale Fair to score. You say that a lot about Watford, but... It doesn't I always do, pay yeah, off. You know what? That, I do, and it rarely pays off. But yeah, this is the thing. get a better side. It's just that, you know, it's not that it's untrue. It's just that I think you say it in unfortunate weeks. <laughs> Probably. Because <laughs> they do play really well other weeks. I watched them against Leicester last week. I'm like, oh, geez, they've got, they've got a decent side. But then they go out and shit the bed this last weekend. Uh, then you've got Swansea against Man City, 5-20. Random kickoff times just because of TV. Uh, there's no need to overthink this at all. City are in pissed off give me my trophies now mode and even if they're trying to play it down and not jinx it by speaking about it at all the possibility of a quadruple is on the mind of every player and staff member in the club right now uh, this is a gimme coming off a champions even coming off a champions league week 5-0 city Sané to score ho ho Swans to the slaughter maybe unlike their building their opponents Swansea weren't able to take the week off as they were bashed 3-0 by West Brom including the worst penalty in the history of time uh, have you seen this yet from last night's games no oh, I'm going to show it to you after it's absolutely horrific he's basically he's um, it's only McBurney I think it is plants his standing foot and decides to kick the ball off it and it just bobbles oh. up to the right it doesn't even go forward oh. it's hilarious oh Jesus but, so tweet that out if it, on Paddy's New Year yeah. as well so other people can see Here's my case for the defence for Swansea. Their league position is safe and their home form is extremely solid. Their last defeat at Liberty was back on St. Stephen's Day. 
Pep side came unstuck to Wigan last season, and Swansea play a very similar style of football. On a scuttery night in Wales, I could maybe be talked into it. But I'm not being a hero. I'm not saying it's going to be a dominance. I'm going to go for 2-0 with the City with Jesus a City mar- as they march towards the second piece of silverware. But, like, I'm just... I wouldn't be surprised if this was a lot tighter than people think. What you have to keep in mind is City don't have a, any games now for the next two weeks. So they don't have to rest players here. They can just play their full strength team. And, like, City can take apart the best teams 5-0. Like, I'm not saying, like, I'm married to 5-0. I'm not saying I'm married to them winning heavily. I'm just saying, to me, like, it's City logic. Is if, if City are on fire, if they're in form, if they're healthy, if everything's looking good and they want to win, they can just impose their will on any team. So that's yeah. the logic there. But, no, interesting logic, too, with, with Swansea. I, do, I, I, I am intrigued. You've sold me a bit more on watching the match, uh, but I'm not changing my pick. Uh, late, late game on Saturday night at 5-8. Yeah. to eight. Fuck you. It's 5-8 uh, to eight is the new 5 fast two I hear. Uh, if, though a lot of you won't see this. I won't see this. I've got Scrapper Mania on, so we shall... Uh, I'm in work. I'll be keeping an eye on it. Wolves against Man United. It's going to be a hell of a game. I'll probably like try sneak a bit of it on the phone. Uh, had United got something out of the Arsenal game last week, I'd be looking at an upset special here. We've seen how Wolves all season can put it up to the big teams. They're the reason Liverpool aren't here, sure. But subsequent rounds of the Cup have shown a more brittle side to them. And subsequent weeks for Wolves. I know they had a big performance against Chelsea, but that's that's Chelsea. I don't know if that counts. They're, they're dodgy week to week. Uh, to keep in mind, here's their run since winning the Liverpool game. They need a replay to see off Shrewsbury and won a nervy 1-0 over Bristol City. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer will want to play spoiler to the noisy neighbours and, and, and be the fly in the ointment of their quadruple season. A loss here takes away United's best realistic hope and starts asking questions of if his magic has worn off. Spoiler alert, it has not. The players clearly love playing for him and believe in what they're doing. And just as we said, CD don't play for a couple of weeks, United don't play for a couple of weeks. He can feel he's got an injury crisis, but he can also feel a pretty strong team here. He doesn't need to rest players for the League or Champions League. He'll have them up for this and won't need much work in doing so. They will be firing after the Arsenal game. They will be raging they lost their streak and looking to get back on it again. I'd be saying something different if they beat Arsenal last week. Unfortunately, they didn't. That spells bad news for Wolves. 3-1 to United, Rashford score. Yeah, it's a quick reminder here. Man City, Chelsea, Spurs, Arsenal, Man United have all dropped the league points to Wolves so far this season. The only side that are missing there from the big six are Liverpool. Nuno, Nuno's lads play them on the final day of the season, which could be a title decider. Interesting. So, yes, they've beaten them in the cup. They haven't beaten them in the league, and they've taken points off everyone else in the league. Just saying, Liverpool fans, mm. don't get too cocky. Mm. Three of those wins in Monaco came at Molyneux, where the paying fan is seeing an average of 2.73 goals per game. Only Fulham have a higher rate than that, and Fulham have them for the wrong reasons. Wolves have nothing to lose against United. United are in the top four race. Yes, they've got a couple of weeks off. It would have sounded mad a few short weeks ago. Ollie's unbeaten run finally came to an end at the hands of Arsenal. Anyone who's saying that this is all doom and gloom now is an idiot. Because the pressure's now off the players. They've lost the back, so they're still going to play exactly mm. the same. Yeah. Still, the cup always brings one weird result per round. So give me Wolves after extra time. 2-1 no. Jimenez. No, you're letting your Wolves you're bias. You're not you would say that. You're letting your, yeah, but you're, you're letting your Wolves bias get to you there. There is no evidence the Wolves are going to win this. There is no nothing on paper. You are just going on a hunch in the fact that you like to pick Wolves in big games. Like that, that's it. There's no They're evidence. Been good so far this year. There's no evidence the Wolves are going to win this. No, I'm sorry. I don't see it. Uh, anyway, okay. last but not least in the cup. Sunday, 2 no p.m. No points anyway. It's fine. Sunday, 2 p.m. <laughs> Millwall against Brighton. Yeah, you can be as ballsy as you like here. It doesn't matter. Uh, and Millwall's annual cup run sees Brighton arrive at the den in for an absolute scrap. And look, yeah, the Lions have included Everton among their scalps the, along the way here. But that's really the only scalp you wouldn't have expected them to take. Of course... They've been good in the FA Cup in the past few years, let's not forget it. But they've also beaten Hull and Wimbledon, and it doesn't exactly spell out a glorious cup run that spells like, oh, Brighton should be afraid of these guys. No, Everton were in shitty form as 
as well during that period too. So I'm not reading too much into it and overthinking here. Realism is going to kick in at some stage. And the facts are that Millwall are 19th in the championship and their win over Birmingham midweek came off the back of four losses before that. An upset isn't completely out of the question, but they face a Brighton side coming back into health and coming back into form. Two wins on the bounce and knowing that a win here and a favourable draw could put them only needing to beat Watford or Palace to reach the final. It'll be tight. It won't be pretty. But Brighton are winning this 2-1 with Murray to score. Yeah, like the lines were excellent in their midweek win over Birmingham. And this is why I love being a championship person because I'm watching these sides each week and I'm like, yay, the championship are doing well. Fuck Millwall. Um, they're down the bottom, Reading are down the bottom. I hope that they get as far as they want in this competition because they're going to have to be distracted. As you mentioned, they stopped a four-game losing streak when they beat Birmingham, but they also stopped one of the championship brightest stars in Shea Adams. It was a real old school. Do you remember... I, I, I say to you to remember the 80s, like the old 80s mill war, you're just like, this is filthy. This is horrific. You've probably seen the takes yeah, yeah, yeah. on your VHS <laughs> and your Walkman <laughs> that you still have, apparently. <laughs> Look, Brighton have a relegation scrap of their own, but a five-point cushion means that they can hold off the Dragons of Cardiff for another week at least. The eye test will tell you Brighton definitely played a better football, and Millwall are without a win in five at their home ground. They've got bigger fish to fry, but it won't be easy for Brighton. I'm going to go 1-0 in a scrappy, like, mud-flying, studs-up challenges everywhere. 1-0, Glenn Murray. Okay, interesting. Look, uh, anyone who listens to me long enough will know that, like, if you give me something like a quarterfinals... I'm going to take it and bet on all four games. Like, that's just what yes. I have to do. Uh, it's just part of it. And again, I've won, like, I'm in profit for the entire season. So I'm playing with house money at this stage. So fuck it. I'm going for it. FA Cup quarterfinals. Uh, I'm going under 2.5 goals in Watford against Crystal Palace. Reminder, neither have conceded a goal in their run to this stage in the competition. I'm going Man City with the minus two handicap. There's some great odds on these, by the way. Man City with the minus two handicap is 11 to 10. Man United to win outright is 6 to 5. And Brighton to win outright. This is where I was most surprised. Eleven to ten. So that's that's a pretty decent acker there. Five euro on that with Paddy Power will get you eighty three euro seventy nine cent. It is decent. Dave, Dave uh, what will you be keeping an eye out for this week and weekend? There's going to be some midweek action you'll be keeping an eye out for. Yeah, look, to, I can't give my tips for Cheltenham today Thursday because I don't have to show me out in time. So I'm looking at Friday. I'm going to go for the Gold Cup. I'm going to talk about the Gold Cup. All the hype around it is presenting Percy. But William Mullins has never won a Gold Cup. He's finished second six times. And he has a quarter of the field in this one. I like the look of Bells Hill for Ruby Walsh to finally deliver to Ireland's greatest trainer. Gordon Elliott has a shot as well. But I'm thinking he's going to go for the race beforehand. Commander of Fleet. And like, moving on, there's another... um, The FA Cup again, yes. But uh, the rest of the championship is in action. The championship's tried to steal the title of the greatest league in the world last week. (laughs) First of all, West Brom sacked Darren Moore. That's West Brom, who I was talking about for a title challenge two weeks ago. They're fourth in the table, guaranteed a playoff spot with a manager who'd won almost half his games with the club. Do you remember how bad West Brom were last yeah. year? And then Darren Moore came in? Yeah. Darren Moore took them from a wrinkly ball sack of a side to the Premier League to a well oiled machine in the Championship where they're definitely in the playoffs. They are going to have, they're going to be 180 minutes away from the play at Premier League again. Fucking idiots. I hope they get, I hope they got caught now. <laughs> also, Mick Foley had breakfast with Billy Sharp. Who's Billy Sharp? Yeah. The Sheffield United striker. Oh, okay. And Mick Foley, wrestling legend. Don't know. All Basically, right. Sharp did a, Sharp did a Mr. Socko celebration earlier on in the year. Foley saw it and decided, right. do you know what? I'm going to do one of my famous stand up comedy gigs there and I'm going to go have breakfast with Billy Sharp. So, yeah. That, like it's random. It's it's random. Like the title race is down to three sides: Leeds, Norwich, and the aforementioned Sheffield United. Leeds can put five points between them and the Blades when they meet in Saturday's early game, and they'll need to because Norwich are on fire. The thing is, Sheffield United have kept five clean sheets in a row, and this is the final meeting between the top three sides Ooh. and the top three for the rest of the year. It's all about bottle now. Interesting. Last night uh, there was obviously midweek action for the Championship. I tweeted a picture from the Pies New York Twitter account just on the Championship table. Nine points separate the team in fifth, who's Middlesbrough from the team in 13th, and that's Hull. And there's a good chunk of those eight teams in between playing sort of this weekend. We've got Preston, Preston against Birmingham and Villa against Middlesbrough, with the others having a weekend off due to the Cup. So it's really coming into it. Down the bottom, that Millwall win I mentioned a couple of Rotherham's win over QPR and Reading's defeat to Leeds. See four sides fighting to avoid the final spot in the drop zone. On 36 points, you have Rotherham, Reading and Wigan, with Millwall one point above them and Bolton seven behind them. This weekend, Rotherham host the league leaders, Nor- Norwich, 
Reading go to Stoke and Wigan play Bolton, who could give themselves a shot on the arm with the win. It's really getting to this tight, tight time. And the last thing of the weekend is actually the first thing that happens. Katie Taylor is fighting. And this weekend, the media haven't really been on it, but she can set up a huge unification fight with WBC champion Delphi Pursued in June if she can knock off Rose Vallant on Friday on Sky Sports. I think she can easily enough. She's been in imperious form in the last few fights. Mm. And um, Rose Vallant, great fighter, but I think over the distance, Katie has her. Interesting. That's what you're keeping an and eye please. on. please. <laughs> That's what you're keeping an eye on for the week. I'm going to be keeping an eye on the European League, starting with La Liga. And all eyes will be on Real Madrid. Saturday afternoon kickoff with Celta Vigo as Zinedine Zidane makes his return to the sideline. And what, you know, you'd expect to be a soft landing as Celta are in a relegation fight without their star man, Iago Aspas. He's out for the season. In the title race, if Atletico can win a tricky away tie to Babel, they'll put pressure on Barca's Sunday night clash away against Batiste. So, uh, the the league may become interesting again. Again, not worth like going out of your way to watch, on, especially on Paddy's Day, but worth keeping an eye on on your phone. Meanwhile, High Fly and Hatafe are now four points clear in fourth. They face a real test on Sunday with a visit to seventh place Valencia, who need a win to keep pace with the top four. So, some stuff to be interested in La Liga. In Serie A, though, this is kicking into gear. It's all hmm. about the Milan Derby this Sunday evening. Third meets fourth in the Sa- San Siro. Winner gets some breeding space in the championship. Champions League spots, the loser could be immediately dragged into a scrum of sides looking for that fourth spot. Milan have won their last five in the league and are unbeaten in ten, driving this ascent to third spot, while Inter have won just three of eight, having previously looked comfortable. Mero Arcadi's goal was the difference in the last game between the two, but of course he's on exile with the side now, and talk has turned that he is on Zidane's wish list at Madrid for the summer. Having signed uh, Icardi and Hazard for Man United, and recently made my way to the Champions League final in FIFA, uh, really good signing to that. <laughs> it really it pays dividends. Get Griezmann in there, and you're absolutely set. Uh, plus, Inter have a tricky Europa League tie with Frankfurt to navigate first, whereas Milan can focus on this game entirely all week. You tip the scales towards Milan here, but anything can happen in a derby. Meanwhile. In the best title race outside of the Premier League this season, it got even better this week. The Bundesliga. Mm. We had another twist last week. And despite Bayern and Dortmund both winning, Bayern's 6-0 win over Wolfsburg saw them finally leapfrog Dortmund in the standings on goal difference. It's that tight. This weekend, Dortmund have a chance to reclaim top spot temporarily on Saturday as they travel to mid-table Hertha Berlin. Then it's Bayern's turn to step up Sunday evening as they try to respond to their Champions League disappointment against Mainz. There's two goals in it now. So even the scorelines matter. Absolutely fascinating stuff. And it would be a massive blow to Dortmund if they couldn't get the job done. They are all some great leagues that I'll be keeping an eye on. But, of course, they are not the greatest league in the world. So, Dave, (laughs) tell me what's going on in the LOI. Well, the February's Player of the Month was named on Monday. And it was Bohemian striker Danny Corcoran. Both, of course, the top of the league up until a couple weeks ago. Um, He forgot to tell both his manager and the Bohemian's press officer and he was on countdown four hours later. <laughs> and I shit you not, one of his first numbers game, the target was four four two. Brilliant. <laughs> he was asked. He was asked by host Nick Nick here about why the league switched to summer football. To be honest, I don't know. Mm. So you're like representing the league well there. Also. I'm mean, going to talk about Azra Beckovic earlier. Here's why. He got a pair of boots delivered to Bishopstown Stadium, right. the training race of Cork City. Um, we don't know why. Like he could, I don't know if anyone knows why. You could say that was just a bit random, or that maybe one of his ex teammates, Matt Smith, who's with City at the moment, was playing a prank. That was until Azra Beckovic started liking and retweeting tweets about Friday's game with balls on how fans can get tickets to it. Ooh. It's random. <laughs> it's almost as random as Roma with Damien Delaney for the last couple of years, but. You know, the League of Ireland is a nice retirement home for keepers. So, Asmir, if if you're unhappy with stupid sexy Eddie Howe, I mean, less sexy kind of dickheadish John Caulfield is still there. <laughs> he, he'll shout more at you. He won't be as nice to look at. But, you know, you'll get the job done. Right. Look, on the field, pick of the action is either that game between the countdown kid and begging with his army and turn his cross or the Dundas trip to Derry. Part of that, you don't have much. No game on TV again. Oh, the joys. Look, sure. Uh, struggling. And here's the thing. You're selling me with this greatest league in the world stories. I, I'm actually, I'm getting into it now. And I want to watch <laughs> it. And there's just fucking nothing. It felt like last season they had... <laughs> Weekend, 
next weekend is the first live game and I can't wait we don't have a show next week whoops I know <laughs> I know so I was, uh, I'm not bringing back the show just for the yellow eye and the just internationals the uh, right okay yeah. uh, guys as I said we've no show next week so uh, we will be back in a couple of weeks here on Paddy's new yacht so we are going could we send you into it with a cliffhanger David Kent you are two points behind me now in the Kent on Kent quiz at the end of the show we do if you're a newer listener uh the quiz we do is basically david kent my esteemed colleague is uh is a reporter for the daily star and buzz.e every week we quiz him on stories that he himself has reported so we're going to be uh testing his knowledge now and seeing how that goes as soon as we get the video chat up and running to make sure no hijinks ensue three questions on the board uh guys uh th- now okay like in the past couple of weeks i'm not gonna lie i made it a bit easier because you were struggling you had yeah, a bit of a you meltdown did. You did. i've gone back to normal this week they're not absolutely okay. terrible but they're the regular standard for kent on kent so we shall see question one you reported on cristiano ronaldo's monstrous eighth champions league hat trick during the week to take juventus true over atletico madrid but who did he score his last champions league hat trick against before the Madrid one. Before the Atletico one. Hmm. You see, I always remember it's like he always scored. He scored one and Messi scored four the night after to fucking break it. But it was a notable did game. He, did he score in the hat trick in the final against? Fuck was it Madrid or Juve? No, he scored the fourth against Madrid because Bale and Ramos scored. I'm gonna go with the hat trick against Juve in the final, was it? Why would I answer that? <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, Why would I yet, tell anyway. you the answer. <laughs> All yeah. right, you're going for. Do you know what? I'll, lo- I'll lock in Juve. You just have to name the stops. team. You just you don't have to name the just the yeah, team. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, no, but I'm trying to work. I'll, I'll lock in Juve, but I just. There's probably one now that's like, it's got to be obvious, obvious. Okay, interesting. Right, question two. You reported on Declan Rice winning the FAI Young Player of the Year as discussed throughout the show. Who won the award last year? Cyrus Christie. Straight in with an answer there. You seem very confident. Because the uproar was about Cyrus Christie winning it at the age of 25, being young. Okay, interesting. It's it's up for debate. I still consider thirty one young, for the record. Just saying. So. <laughs> I, I I no controversy there for me. Last still but not time. last but not least, you reported on Ronnie O'Sullivan becoming the first snooker player to reach a thousand century breaks to win the players' championship in style. He also has the record for the most average centuries per match. Who is second behind him in most average centuries of all time? You either know this or it's a total guess. Well, Hendry's behind him in total, but Hendry played a lot of fucking games. And John Higgins is the other one. Your logic is all over the place already. I can tell okay. you that much. So someone who hasn't played a lot of snooker you games. Need to, you, need to think of it, you need to think of it logically. I'm confident <laughs> yeah, in giving so you most... clues here because I'm confident. Hang on, that... cent... sorry. Cent... Av- oh, yeah, average sorry, centuries sorry, I'm thinking match. 147. Sorry, no, my apologies. So who scores the most average centuries per match? Shot in the dark, John Trump. Okay. It seemed like you can have an opportunity so. to change it if you want. Like Trump, Selby. I don't. Neil Robertson doesn't get that many. Trump always does, but he doesn't go anywhere near the one four seven, which kind of hitting. Ding Jong Wee does a lot of them as well, but like I couldn't, I couldn't confidently say one of them. So I'm just going to go with Trump. Okay. Go with Trump. It led America astray. Will it leave <laughs> David Kent astray? <laughs> you were correct with Cyrus Christie. You knew that already. Yeah, okay, There's did, no yeah. shocks there. Cristiano Ronaldo's the last team he scored a hat trick against before Atletico Madrid during the week was Atletico Madrid. <laughs> it was a trick question. Last year's Champions League final. <laughs> You're gonna kick yourself. We question three as well because it was not John Trump. So Ken Darty. Uh, it was not. <laughs> you did say the name of the person it was. Neil oh, Robertson no. was third in the list. 
Ding Jun Wee was second. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake. The logic was... Don't tell me it's Selby. I th- no, Ding Jun Wee was second. That's it. That's the answer. Ding Jun Wee. Oh, sorry. Yeah. We asked who was second. Ronnie O'Sullivan is first. So, uh, there you go. The logic was... You got to think the sports improved over the years, so you're thinking of modern yeah. players. And when you started to think of that, I was like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> so there we go, fifteen, twelve, heading have, into Ronaldo. The... Ronaldo is the. I'm very, very annoyed at myself for that one because I said the final against Atletico. <laughs> I was talking about the other final against Atletico. It was the Bale semi-final last year. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm not. I don't feel as bad. <laughs> but even still. Look, Dave, you have the international break to recover, to heal up your yeah, the I'll injuries you've suffered. So uh, we <laughs> shall see if you'll be back uh, as we head into the finishing straight of the season. 15-12 to wrap us off here on Paddy's New York. Guys, enjoy the weekend. Enjoy Paddy's weekend. Even if you don't get to watch much sports because you're out watching the wrestling, that's a fine way to spend Paddy's weekend. Or even if you're pissed and don't remember any of it, we'll remind you when we're <laughs> back here next time on Paddy's New York in two weeks. So stay tuned for that. But until then, for David Kent, I've been Rick Nash, and this has been... Paddy's New York.